Sunday in Louisville at my church where I was serving and had served for almost a decade. And I've been thinking about that and going back and back to that moment in that season, and it was one of the more miraculous uh, moments uh, in that for 10 years, I don't recall crying. As a priest, you take a deep breath. You know you're going into whether it be tragedy or expected but still heavy loss, or you have to get to the pulpit and, and get all the way through your, your words. But I remember for 10 years, uh, whether it be tragedy to our family, tragedy to the parish family, whether it be uh, joys, uh, triumphs, uh, conflict, uh, not a tear was shed. And it would drive my wife nuts to, uh, to some degree. Um, but I felt like somehow whatever it took to get through it uh, seemed to form kind of a hard outer shell. And equally as perplexing uh, to my family, especially my wife, was the last six weeks in Louisville where I couldn't hand out communion without just a flood of tears uh, coming over. And almost every uh, interaction on the way out of church or a coffee hour, uh, I could hardly watch a commercial without breaking down in tears. And as I reflected on it, it seemed like every tear that had been withheld from the hospital room, uh, the joy of holding a new child, uh, the difficulty of, of, of being with a, a parent who, who lost an expected child or a child or, uh, or a beloved spouse or the, the triumph of, uh, of a successful uh, renovation or a holy week that seemed to touch every cord, whatever it was, those tears seemed to come out all at once. Tears of watching people divorce, the joy of seeing them come together, the joy of baptism, the pain of death, all of it seemed to come out. And for days, and especially at that moment where I stood at the pulpit, which was on this side, uh, and I couldn't get through the words as I was preaching on this particular reading, there was moments of a 30 to 45 seconds where I just couldn't breathe deeply enough or hold it back to keep going. First time in my ministry. I felt like all of those tears were the tears that we shared together, all being spilled out. I think today's gospel is grace spilled forward. 120 to 180 gallons of wine spilled forward throughout the generations, spilled into the cup we will receive today, spilled into the grace that we know is in our lives. Jesus, in that first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, is spilling out God's love and God's grace and God's goodness for the rest of time. So we will never know scarcity apart from God's love and abundance. But a little bit about a wedding. To give you a little context for the story. And... This is one of those readings uh, that in the history of Epiphany, there was three readings that would get told every year. The three wise men coming that would kick off this season, the baptism of Jesus, and this first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. It was the beginning of his ministry. And John, unlike the other gospel writers, is less concerned about how things actually happened than what it means. So when we look at this, uh, when we illumine the story, what does it say about Christ who came into the world? What does this first sign tell us about God? So about weddings. Uh, and I spent a little bit of time this Christmas break going over our, our wedding. We had friends come in town, and for the first time in years, our wedding album got pulled off the shelf and, and sifted through, and we looked at all the pictures. And those details, they... They don't get fuzzy. They don't fade with time. Ask me what last week was like, and I couldn't tell you, but ask me about the details of the wedding from the, the priest dropping the ring on the marble floor and that ding heard all the way through that historic church. The, uh, the groomsman whose uh, bow tie broke, because it wasn't really a bow tie, it had a little clip and trying to duct tape or whatever he did to get his, 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 his bow tie five minutes before the service. Finding out the next day from the maid of honor that the cake had spilled over in the car and a, a can of whipped cream had to be used to, to, to uh, shore up the side. Uh, to my wife, uh, negotiating with the band well after the contracted time of them uh, to finish performing had ended, uh, if they could keep on going just a few more songs. All of those 
moments are etched in time. And as an anxious couple comes to me with, a, with all this desire to make their wedding perfect, I tell them it's those foibles uh, and those little things that weren't expected um, that add layer and richness and texture to those memories. Uh, and I believe that to be 100% true, but if I was giving advice uh, to someone in the first century, I have to say that it's not the same. <clears throat> In the first century, the foibles lasted, and not in a good way. The shame brought upon this family if they ran out of wine, if this party didn't live up to expectations, was huge. It's a shame culture, and it would be wrought upon the family for the rest of their days. And they waited to get married until they had all the resources to be able to put on uh, the, the fitting celebration, and it would last days, and it would be people from the community around, and, and others in the community would help make sure that the family's reputation was preserved. And somehow we have at this wedding uh, an incredible absence of wine. They ran out, and Mary is embarrassed for them. And Mary knows what it must be like uh, to have to go through the shame of, of all of this. Uh, and she feels it viscerally uh, to the point where she elbows uh, Jesus. But, but let's go back a second before we get to that uh, and remember how this gospel starts. What are the first words in this story? The first words of the second chapter of John on the third day. So remember, as we look at this wedding story, that it echoes all the way back to creation, uh, but it also echoes forward to what else happened on the third day. Something else spilled out for all of us. Some hope that was born on the third day when Jesus rose again from, from the dead. So all of that is pregnant in this story uh, as John tells us about this first sign, this first miracle. So then Mary is nudging uh, Jesus, and uh, as, as a child, we know that when our mom uh, sometimes asks us things without a question mark at the end, we still know there's a question there. Uh, you know, the, 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 they're out of wine, honey, uh, was a question. It was a statement, and it was an order. Uh, and Jesus knew that, uh, and as we hear six times in John, as he builds up uh, towards that cross, uh, towards that ultimate act, uh, my hour has not yet come. He'll say that again. My hour has not yet come. Until at the very end, he says, my hour has come. But that's not enough for Mary, who nudges him a little bit more, uh, who understands. Uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about the incarnation, about God becoming human, is this is about as human a story as you can get. Uh, it is one thing for, for God to, uh, uh, to invest in all of the disenfranchised, all of the hunger that the world has, uh, but to be pregnant in a moment of, of real intimate familial shame uh, and, and, and to, to understand what all of us go through on a, on a regular basis of, of being in a situation where, uh, where we're stuck. And that's the context for the first miracle. How human. But one of the great things about the first miracle is it's not in front of the whole party. It's not a show. It's really intentionally in private to save that family the shame. So he goes out and he finds these six enormous jars that hold between 20 and 30 gallons each. And they're stone uh, because stone's less porous than the clay. Uh, and because of their purpose, uh, their purification, uh, it's easier to have the stone because you have to do a whole lot of, uh, uh, of other prayers and whatnot to purify a clay vessel. So the heavy stone jars that they have to carry down to fill to the brim with water. And also their purification jars. So they're not meant to be filled with wine. It would be blasphemy to drink out of a container like this, but Jesus transforms that, the water to wash us clean so that we might be worthy of God, to wash away our shame, wash away our mistakes, to wash away all the things that we think separate us from God. God transforms them in to the wine that is spilled out for all of us. And if we think that's an accident, look at the very next story. John places right after this story the clearing of the, uh, of the, of the changing tables in front of the temple. That the other gospel writers wait until uh, the moment that gets Jesus arrested. John goes straight from this story to turning over the other things that keep people from God's grace and God's love. So he takes these things that they're counting on to purify themselves, to be right with God, and he fills them with wine. And then he pours it out, uh, and the only people that know about this are the, the least of these, the, the hired hands, and they take it to the steward who says, this is the finest wine. Nobody does that. You get them a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit tipsy, then you pull out the cheap stuff. 
Uh, you did it in reverse. But what we're getting here is a sense of God's grace and God's mercy and God's goodness and God's love poured out in that first sign that we'll see echoed again throughout Scripture, that we'll see echoed again in our own lives. So as we read this story, pull all those layers apart, realize all the grace, all of the, the human moments of it, Realize that that excessiveness, 120 to 180 gallons of water, that's not just bad party planning. There's a reason there is that much. And that's because when we arrive at this table, we realize that God is still spilling that abundance and that love and that redeeming grace into our own cups. And we drink from it just like they did at that wedding banquet. Amen.